I look at the current situation and I think there can be more carnage on equities. Uh, no reason to think that it, that it won't happen. But there's a buying opportunity coming. Buying opportunity in the U.S. is probably coming, but secondly, buying opportunities outside the U.S. look a lot more interesting. On WealthTrack, financial thought leader, innovator, and global fund manager Rob Arnott on inflation's resurgence and the return of value. Funding provided by ClearBridge Investments, First Eagle Investments, Royce Investment Partners, Matthews Asia, Strategus Asset Management, and Women Investing in Security and Education. Hello and welcome to this edition of WealthTrack. I'm Consuelo Mack. A year ago on WealthTrack in September of 2021, research affiliates Rob Arnott predicted there were very high odds of a resurgence in inflation and that the long outperformance of growth over value stocks was probably finally over. He dated the turn to August of 2020. Well, let's look at what's happened since. Inflation as measured by the consumer price index bottomed in the COVID lockdown lows of the summer of 2020. Prices gradually recovered and then went parabolic, starting in the fall of 2021 when Arnott made his prediction on wealth track. Then there are the many heralded and mostly wrong predictions that the record-setting decade and a half-long dominance of growth stocks over value stocks would soon reverse because the gap had lasted so long and was so wide. Arnott was among them. But in his year-ago wealth truck appearance, he put a date to the long-awaited turn. August of 2020. Here's how growth and value have performed since. Has value finally found its footing? Rob Arnott is the chairman of the board and founder of Research Affiliates, which is celebrating its 20th anniversary this year. Research Affiliates describes itself as a research-intensive asset management firm that focuses on innovative products. Among the innovations that he has pioneered is fundamental indexation, building in indexes with stocks weighted on the size of their fundamentals, such as sales, profits, cash flow, book value, and dividends, not traditional market capitalization. He was awarded the prestigious William F. Sharp Lifetime Achievement Award for that innovation. Since then, Research Affiliates has created numerous fundamental indexes for a wide variety of markets and asset classes around the world. Among the many funds that Arnott created and now co-manages is the PIMCO All Asset Fund, also celebrating its 20th anniversary this year. The nearly $15 billion fund was a pioneer in investing in a wide range of assets through various mutual funds, in this case, PIMCOs. And it has achieved its goal of delivering returns of 5% above the consumer price index over full market cycles for most of its 20-year existence. I began this wide-ranging interview with the inflation question. What's Arnott's outlook now? Inflation will moderate. It's just going to take a lot longer mm -hmm. than um, the Fed expects or the market expects. Yeah. Unless the Fed keeps going on tightening so aggressively that they push the economy completely off a cliff. If you have home price deflation, right. a, la, a la 2007, then that's another matter entirely. But um, uh, they're a long way from that. They, they, they've raised rates to um, the low threes. They're expected mm -hmm. to raise rates to the mid fours mid by fours. the end of the year. Right. And uh, Volcker raised rates to 20. There was a study that looked at the peaks of inflation, double digit inflation in various countries around the world and asked how long does it take to get inflation down uh, below two. Mm -hmm. And the short answer is it ranged anywhere from six years to 35 years. Wow. <laughs> the average yeah. was 10. Right. Um, which means that uh, Wall Street, which currently break even inflation rates for the tips market, are at 2.3% for the 10 year. And uh, the likelihood of us having 2.3% average inflation for the coming 10 years is very slim. Is inflation going to moderate? Yes. Mm -hmm. Is it going to moderate soon? No. It'll take time. Mm -hmm. uh, our expectation would be that inflation will remain um, high single digits, meaning 5 to 8 percent uh, next year, and quite possibly in 2024 before it really begins to soften. The exception there is if the Fed continues to hike 
aggressively to achieve positive real rates, which would require six or seven percent Fed funds rate. Um, and if they do that, the, the um, uh, economy falls off a cliff and deep recessions are profoundly disinflationary. So right. uh, we could get there the wrong way. And the simple fact is monetary policy operates with a lag. So yes. if you're tightening now, you expect it to start to crush demand one or two years hence. Okay. So by the time you notice the economic impact, the risk is that you're well past the point you should have gotten to. Now, the, the interesting thing looking at the Fed is it's not just about um, the Fed funds rate. It's also about quantitative tightening, reducing the size of their balance sheet. Their balance right. sheet is humongous. And any efforts to reduce the size of that are a form of tightening. It removes capital um, uh, from the Fed's balance sheet and uh, thereby removes some capital indirectly from the macro economy. And they're uh, doing that right now on a regular basis, a monthly basis. But isn't it shocking that 12 months ago, uh, our Federal Reserve Board was expecting a one-eighth point rise, give or take, in the Fed funds rate by the end of this year mm. at a time when inflation was already running 6%. The narrative is, don't worry, this is going to take time to go away, but it's, it's getting under control. So what we wind up with is a situation where the Fed um, panicked about inflation that it didn't see coming, is likely to overreact and push the economy off a cliff. That doesn't mean that there aren't interesting things to invest in. Mm -hmm. And so the implications, it's th it sounds like th that scenario, and, and the Fed evidently frequently does overshoot, right? Both on it the does. easing, which we've certainly experienced, mm -hmm. and in tightening. Um, so the implications for the markets do not sound positive to me, certainly for stocks at any rate, for risk assets, so-called risk assets. And what are the implications for uh, the bond market? That's They're not positive either. <laughs> that, that's. That's exactly it, what we're seeing. We're seeing the yeah, worst so, meltdown in the bond market in U.S. bond market history wow. ever. Um, there has never been a year when the long bond or the aggregate has performed worse than it has this year. In fact, there's been barely any cases where it was down even half this much. Mm. Stock market is down uh, a little more, but relative to risk, a lot less. And right. there's a lot of people thinking there's going to be catch up on the downside, and there could be. Um, I've been called a perma bear at times. And I am a bear when things are expensive. Mm -hmm. Stock market's 20% less expensive than it used to be. OK, that's nice. But from a very high level, exactly. right? Exactly. I mean, you're a value investor as well. You like to buy things when they're cheap. Yeah. Um, so how does the stock market look to you at these levels? One of the things I love to use is what's called the Schiller P.E. ratio. It's price mm -hmm. relative to 10-year average earnings. Right. So if you use a simple P.E. ratio, then when earnings crash like they did in 2009, you suddenly have a very high P.E., but it's actually a buying opportunity. And if you use smooth 10-year average earnings, you're, look, you, you, you're looking at the price relative to some measure of sustainable profitability. That measure peaked at just under 40 late last year, early this year. And it was higher than that only once in history. It reached 44 in the year 2000, peak of that tech bubble. Right. Um, that ratio is now just under 30. That's not cheap. What, what's the average for the Schiller PE? The average Historical for, average, was it? Yeah, the average for the last 100 years um, is uh, 16. 16. Mm -hmm. The average for the last um, uh, 30 years is more like 25. So we're not that far above the average for the last 30 years. Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't mean it's cheap. And no. so I look at the current situation and I think there can be more carnage on equities. Uh, no reason to think that it, that it won't happen. But there's a buying opportunity coming. Mm -hmm. Now, firstly, buying opportunity in the U.S. is probably coming. But secondly, buying opportunities outside the U.S. look a lot more interesting. International stocks, emerging market stocks. 
right? Yep, and emerging markets debt. All are priced at a uh, huge risk premium relative to the US. Risk premium meaning lower PE ratio to compensate for taking the added mm -hmm. risk of international mm -hmm. investing. Okay, roll the clock forward towards the end of the year, November or December. Um, fears of good German citizens freezing in winter because of uh, the Nord Stream pipeline being shuttered for political reasons. Right. Mm -hmm. Those are those are very legitimate fears. Um, you buy when you're at peak fear. Now you can't gauge exactly when peak fear occurs, but when fear is sharply elevated, mm -hmm. you can start averaging in. And if you are willing to buy when fear lofts from one high to another, uh, you will be averaging in in such a way that you'll have peak exposure at the turn. I, I look on this fall as probably providing a great entry point for non-US stocks, mm -hmm. a great entry point for emerging market stocks. Emerging market stocks have been crushed by the Ukraine thing. And right. what does Ukraine have to do with Indonesia or Chile? Um, apart from food supply chain disruptions and the cost of energy, not much. Now, the um, implications are well, gosh, when something that was cheap has gotten cheaper, that's a buying opportunity. So I think we're going to see some wonderful buying opportunities in the next three to six months. I think the U.S. will be a buying opportunity in the next three to six months. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that I'm going to jump in with both feet into the U.S. It'll still be expensive relative to the rest of the world. Uh, but. Buying when you're at peak fear, people will always say, yeah, but what about this bad news? What about that bad news? What about Putin with his thumb on the nuclear trigger? My answer is always, is the market unaware of this? Mm -hmm. If the market's aware of this, isn't it in the price already? Mm -hmm. And if it's in the price already, then you want to buy when the consensus fear level is at a peak, not when everything's hunky-dory and everybody's happy. And how do you gauge that, Rob? I don't trust my feelings and emotions. Um, uh, like anybody, I get swayed by the news. Right. But I do trust uh, models that compare current valuations with the past. Mm -hmm. And uh, people say emerging markets are cheap for a very good reason. Uh, and besides, they're always cheap. No, roll the clock back to 2008, the peak before the US market cratered in 2008 was at a Schiller P.E. ratio of 28. Stocks mm -hmm. were 28 times their 10-year average earnings. That's exactly where they are now. And that right, was the in, peak. In the US. Right. Uh, emerging markets were at 38 times. Yeah. Okay. Now they're at 12. Emerging markets values at nine times 10-year average earnings. These are very inexpensive levels. Mm -hmm. but it's for the patient investor who doesn't mind being um, out of step for a period of time. So we were strongly bullish on emerging markets at the end of 2015, 2016 was stupendous. We were strongly bullish again at the end of 2018. 2019 was decent. We became strongly bullish again in the aftermath of the COVID crash. The snapback was very good. We're strongly bullish now, but with the cautionary note that while you have escalating fears, you want to average in slowly and gradually. You want your average price to be at current levels or lower. And the best way to get that is to average in. And, uh, and emerging market stocks, you said, and debt. Emerging markets debt has a higher yield, local currency debt has a higher yield than U.S. junk bonds. Mm -hmm. Now, their currencies have been hit hard, so the currencies are cheap. And we're talking about sovereign debt, I mean, government Co debt correct. primarily, right? Yeah. Correct. You can also do corporate debt, mm -hmm. but it's a thin market. There's, mm -hmm. there's not a huge amount. Sovereign debt for emerging markets economies, very similar to U.S. junk bond yields. And are emerging market sovereign borrowers uh, below investment grade? Are they junk category? Half of them are, half of them aren't. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So why on earth should the average yield be similar to U.S. junk bonds? 
that represents, I think, the good risk-off alternative, although most people wouldn't think of emerging markets bonds as risk-off. But look at U.S. Treasuries this, this year. That's not risk-off. The volatility has been off the charts. Yes, it has. An another part of this discussion, and again, a year ago on WealthTrack, you basically said that value had finally turned after many, many years of kind mm -hmm. of false starts. You're saying in August of 2020 that that we really we actually saw the real turn. What changed? Think back to August of 2020. Um, the COVID crash had happened. The lockdowns were almost nationwide. I mean, there were exceptions like Florida, um, but almost nationwide. And uh, the result was intense fear. Uh, intense enthusiasm for and people were were binge watching Netflix during lockdown. They were buying whatever they needed through Amazon. So the tech companies were doing extraordinarily well, uh, meaning that growth had beat value. Russell growth beat Russell value by four thousand basis points, forty percentage points in just eight months. What does that mean? It means the spread in valuation between growth stocks and value stocks was the widest in history, mm -hmm. wider even than at the peak of the tech bubble. The peak wow. of the tech bubble, growth stocks weren't as frothy as they were in August, September of 2020. So we were on record saying, this is extreme. Mm -hmm. Again, for the patient investor, what a great entry point. We didn't know the turn was gonna happen right then. Right. But we did know that the, the narrative, and narratives set market prices and changes in narratives cause markets to move. So the narrative was these tech companies are beautifully positioned for COVID, they're beautifully positioned for a post-COVID world. Was the market aware of that? Of course. That's what set the prices. And all you had to have was a growing narrative that, oh, maybe we're going to get uh, vaccines. Maybe we will find ways to reopen the economy so that the advantage of the tech companies will begin to diminish. It changed the narrative from a, uh, an ebullient view that tech companies were going to own the world right. to, to an optimistic view that, it, that technology companies were going to do great. Well, going from they'll rule the world to they're going to do great is actually a downtick, a big one. And uh, there was also the narrative that the value side of the market was going to see sweeping bankruptcies. Nobody knows how many, uh, nobody knows how serious it's going to get, and then the stimulus started to kick in very quickly, and companies that would have gone bust didn't. And that shocked the market, and all of a sudden, value companies that were being priced as if they were a call option on whether the company would survive started to be valued as going concerns which did in fact have earnings and dividends and net worth and um, apply any sensible multiple to that. And all of a sudden you realize these stocks are cheap. The market rebounded handily for value stocks through May. Mm -hmm. And then we had the, uh, the Delta variant kick in and people thought, oh no, another lockdown. Growth resurged through November and then people realized this is passing. You also had a shift in the mindset of the general public. COVID is not done with us. Mm -hmm. It won't be for a long time. We're done with COVID. The mindset is, all right, we have a nasty, let's call it flu on steroids, mm -hmm. that's gonna be around for a long time. I'm not gonna stop living just because of this. So Rob, why does that help value stocks, that narrative? Because if we're going back, not all the way to a pre-pandemic world, but back in that direction, you're back in a world where um, restaurants can thrive, uh, right. hotels can thrive, uh, people have the travel bug, uh, airlines can thrive. All of the things that were left for dead in 2020 mm -hmm. are now going concerns again and can be valued as such. Rob, another anniversary that you're marking this year is the 20th anniversary of the PIMCO All Asset Fund, which it, again was a pioneer in its field. So it, 
explain uh, the PIMCO All Asset concept. When PIMCO decided to launch the PIMCO All Asset strategy, um, I was already an established player in global asset allocation. And they asked me, how would you do this if, if you were to create a strategy like this? And I walked them through it. Basically, my view was um, people have lots of money in mainstream stocks, lots of money in mainstream bonds. Everything else, what I call the third pillar of investing, strategies that are diversifying away from mainstream stocks, strategies that are, have their own independent source of incremental return, strategies that can protect against inflation, which mainstream stocks and bonds obviously this year can't. Mm -hmm. Why don't we think in terms of creating a strategy that fills a robust third pillar, a one-stop shop for liquid alternative markets, a one-stop shop for reliable uh, real returns and real income. The strategy was launched. I was invited to be the sub-advisor. Mm -hmm. um, uh, to this day, I think I'm the only sub-advisor they've ever had. And so I consider <laughs> that uh, a, a, a real honor and a privilege. Right. Well, good for PIMCO, uh, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've, been, we've achieved the CPI plus five target 70% of the time since the launch of right. the strategy, which is good. The th thing that's interesting is when we don't achieve it, this year we haven't achieved it, right. big time. Uh, when you have a take no prisoners market crash, everything craters, including, including inflation hedges. I mean- you No, know, just uh, about everything's been hit. Exactly, and commodities since March. Uh, mm -hmm. And when you get take no prisoners market crash, everything goes down and then the market does a sorting out process asking, okay, is this now cheap? Is that now cheap? We've seen this again and again. When the diversifiers crater, the snapback can be stupendous. So I'm uh, cautiously optimistic that um, we'll see a snapback that'll uh, uh, surprise investors. I, I, I hope I'm right on that. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the issues in the 2010s is that you had a relentless bull market in stocks, a relentless bull market in growth stocks in particular, and so diversifiers, a friend of mine uh, likes to say that diversification is a regret maximizing strategy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in a bull market, you regret every penny you put in diversifiers. Right. In a choppy sideways market um, uh, or an inflationary market, um, you wish you had a lot more in diversifiers. Uh, Inflation expectations are still anchored in the low twos, break even inflation on a 10-year basis, which is the gap between treasury bond yields and inflation-linked bond yields on a 10-year basis is 2.3. Yeah. With 9% right. trailing inflation. Mm -hmm. That's astonishing. It is astonishing. If inflation expectations start to ratchet higher, these diversifiers can be a wonderful island of serenity in markets that are likely to be roiled. Right. One investment for a long-term diversified portfolio, what would you have us all own some of? I would suggest a blend of inflation hedges. The inflation hedges have been clobbered. They're at very attractive prices. Why are they at very attractive prices? Because everyone believes the Fed's mantra that this will pass, that we'll be back down to 2% that they'll do whatever it takes. And the reality is one of two things, either they do enough to crater the economy big time, or they don't, in which case inflation expectations take off. Uh, in the former case, watch out, mainstream stocks and bonds are in trouble. In the latter case, boy, these diversifiers can soar. So I would say a broad basket of inflation hedging asset classes Emerging market stocks and bonds, REITs, commodities, all represent uh, currently, right now, bargains. Rob, we're going to leave it there. Thank you so much, Rob Arnott, for joining us once again on Wealth Tracks. Always a privilege. Thank you. At the close of every Wealth Track, we try to give you one suggestion to help you build and protect your wealth over the long term. This week's action point is a familiar refrain for Wealth Track viewers. It is diversify into cheap sectors of the market. Research affiliates recently compiled a list of sectors based on their expected returns over the next 10 years 
versus their risk, meaning their volatility. Not surprisingly, the higher the return, the higher the volatility. At the top of the expected performance list are emerging market stocks. Then a group known by the acronym EFA, Europe, Australasia, and the Far East, which is the collection of developed markets outside of North America, Europe itself, and U.S. small cap stocks. Buying way undervalued assets is always painful because they are usually cheap for more than one reason, usually uncertain outlook and years of underperformance, which has made them unpopular and unloved. In other words, they are a value investor's dream. Next week, we will have a rare interview with great investor David Giroux, the award-winning manager of T. Rowe Price Capital Appreciation Fund. In this week's extra feature, Rob Arnott discusses his penchant for high-performance motorcycles, including his most recent acquisition. As always, we invite you to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and our YouTube channel. Thank you for watching. Have a super weekend and make the week ahead a healthy, profitable, and productive one.